common medical errors SLPs may encounter. How to avoid common mistakes as an SLP. We all have the absolute best intentions and lofty goals when it comes to how we serve our patients as medical SLPs. But it's important to take the time to learn about and understand how common mistakes and medical errors can occur on the job. Discussing the uncomfortable parts of working in the medical field can help us better prevent unwanted mistakes from happening and improve the effectiveness of our work. This is exactly why I'd like to take just a few short minutes today to shine the spotlight on this topic and focus on three medical errors or mistakes SLPs can unintentionally contribute to based on their roles and responsibilities. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Changing diets at the bedside. This is one of those practices that SLPs did all the time that we now know not to do. I'm specifically addressing SLPs in this video, but please feel free to share this with nurses and CNAs as they often do this as well with the best of intentions. Before we knew all of the risks of modified diets and thickened liquids, we thought we were being safer by recommending thickened liquids or a puree diet from just doing a bedside clinical swallow exam. But now we understand why we should not do this without an instrumental assessment to deem that it is in fact beneficial for the patient to have. Unless of course the patient specifically requests a modified diet or thickened liquids or does not wanna participate in a study. Now we do know that thickened liquids can be beneficial for some patients, as it can slow down the speed of the bolus to allow for a safer and more efficient swallow, but this isn't always the case, and as always, is very patient specific. If a patient doesn't truly need thickened liquids as verified by an instrumental assessment, then they should not be recommended. We have studies dating back to 2008 with the Robin study that discovered that there is an increased risk of aspiration pneumonia development with the use of honey thickened liquids. More recently, in 2018, Miles et al. concluded that patients may be more likely to silently aspirate thickened liquids than thin liquids. So although we might think it's safer to recommend thickened liquids at the bedside, we could possibly be causing unintentional harm to the patient. This is why getting that instrumental assessment is so important. My motto with instrumental assessments is that I'm never surprised because I'm always surprised. I've seen so many patients that have been on thickened liquids because we thought it was safer, when really they had even more trouble with the thickened liquids. Same for modified diets. I've seen plenty of patients that were on pureed diets that had so much trouble clearing residue effectively and actually were able to swallow much more effectively and efficiently with a regular diet. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't wanna miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, do you have any specific questions about avoiding common medical errors? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. Considerations of upper airway status. There's often talk of trialing food or liquids at the bedside and also phrases like, yeah, people on high flow nasal cannulas can eat, but we also know those types of statements are very nuanced and the proper research on each individual patient needs to be taken before just diving in and feeding these medically complex patients. It's important to consider the patient's current medical status and comorbidities, respiratory status, immune status, oral hygiene, and physical mobility. These factors all need to be critically evaluated prior to starting a diet or trialing foods or liquids. Knowing a patient's respiratory status is paramount to trialing foods or liquids at the bedside. Patients in at least moderate respiratory distress are considered to be at a higher risk for complications related to dysphagia says Bowden et al. in 2009. Depending on the severity of respiratory distress, patients will require oxygen support through a variety of delivery systems. It's important for SLPs to know and understand the different types of oxygen delivery, as well as the different types of cannulas and masks in order to better understand which patients are at a high risk for adverse complications. Again, it's not to say that they should not evaluate as they very much might be ready but rather knowing the red flags that might help you pause and consult respiratory therapy or nursing before proceeding with food and liquid trials. I remember hearing a talk a few years ago that breathing trumps swallowing, and if they can't breathe, they sure as heck can't eat. I wish I could remember who the speaker was because I still hear that voice in my head to this day. The statement has made me stop and pause anytime I see a patient that has any sort of respiratory compromise. Even the tiniest bit of oxygen delivery can still impact the breathing and swallowing coordination pattern. I didn't know nearly as much about modes of oxygen delivery earlier in my career, 
but I worked in an LTAC that had wonderful respiratory therapists who helped teach me all the ins and outs of the different cannulas and masks and modes of delivery. This made me feel so much more comfortable when deciding to proceed with an evaluation or not. I'm grateful I sought out more education in this area and had the amazing relationships that I did with the RTs. There were a few patients that we saw that did present with respiratory compromise that we did decide to hold off on the food and liquid trials at the bedside prior to getting an instrumental assessment. Unnecessary intervention. This one can be tough to hear. We're a helping profession. We got into this field to help people and hearing that we might do something to someone that doesn't help them, well, that's a tough pill to swallow. For so long, we didn't know much about dysphagia, what to look for, how to diagnose, how to treat. But as our field is rapidly evolving and education is improving, we now know a lot more about when to help a patient and also when to know when we aren't needed. Instrumental assessments are crucial to finding the reasoning behind someone swallowing impairments and also what to target during treatment. But oftentimes we suspect things at the bedside and the instrumental rules them out. I've seen this time and time again where a patient was being seen for dysphagia therapy, on a modified diet or thickened liquids, doing tons of exercises only for the instrumental to reveal that they just have post-nasal drip or reflux that requires medical or pharmacological intervention and nothing that SLPs can provide. Furthermore, instrumental assessments can help us identify medical conditions that may require surgical intervention or a physician referral before we should even begin doing exercises. Understanding when we are or are not needed can help us build respect among our DORs, admins, and medical teams. It may sound counterintuitive, but if we're treating every patient for therapy that has a cough at mealtimes, Without a proper diagnosis, and it's not very skilled, it can be a waste of our healthcare system's dollars, it can also be misleading to the patient. There's absolutely nothing wrong with referring a patient to a different profession or saying that their impairments are outside of our scope, or you aren't able to make an effective treatment plan without instrumentals. In fact, that's respectable and demonstrates patient-centered care, and we shouldn't feel like a failure if we aren't the profession that the patient needs to improve. Want some free resources specific to dysphagia? Make sure to download our free clipboard kit at www.medslpcollective.com. We have resources to help guide your decision-making about modifying diets at the bedside and when to refer to other professionals. Additionally, we have a great resource all about the different types of oxygen devices, delivery settings, and the nature of each use that you can download in the link below.